And so I had a guy that I would come to find out later was not just a basketball referee, and he ended up becoming the athletic director and basketball coach at Azusa Pacific. So we have in our presence, in this room, let's show the picture, Mr. Cliff Hamlow right there. Now, for those of you in the contemporary worship service, you got to get to know this guy because last night I decided, let's go to the Biola Azusa basketball game. It's, a, it's futile because Biola, we tend to lose to Azusa. They have beaten us numerous times. And so I, I said, okay, let's see. But I had no idea when I go to the court that look who this court is named after. The court is named after our friend and colleague who will be signing autographs later, <laughs> right there. But nothing could have prepared me with 3.8 seconds left, with Biola losing by two points. They missed the front end, Azusa does, of a one-on-one. -on -one and with 4.8 seconds, the guy rebounds the ball, and this is the result of the game. Eagles, 76. Cougars, 75. Biola, for once, prevails. For once. Now, you say, what in the world does that have to do with what would Jesus do? Well, I thought long and hard. One of the staff guys sitting in the back said, John, you should not rub this in. You're in Azusa territory. I know, but we're going to talk about humility. And so what a better time to talk about this. Would you agree? So now, fast forward the story. At that same time I'm playing basketball, I was in a discipleship group, and our leader had us read a book by a name by the name of In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. How many of you in this room or the other room or online have ever read that book? This is amazing because it was written in 1896. It was based on a sermon series in this little Midwest church that Charles Sheldon was preaching in on a Sunday night service and a series of messages of what would Jesus do if? And each week was an installment. And 10 years later, out comes the book. I read the book, and it would, was a pretty simple deal. Is What would you do if every decision you made, you started with the question, what would Jesus do? And so that little congregation did that in this mythical town and in this book. And it goes on to show what Christ can do in a church and a community if we led with that thought, what would Jesus do? Now, fast forward, I'm a youth pastor in Minnesota. It's in the late 80s, early 90s. And a youth group leader by the name of Janie Tinkleberg in Holland, Michigan, comes up with this bracelet idea to remind her kids, what would Jesus do? WWJD. This has been around for over 20 plus years. They're hard to put on, and I had to have Rick help me put it on because I'm not very nimble. The better ones today would probably be rubber and they just slip them on. But with that question, this movement spread around the world. And so I want to ask you, what would Jesus do? In your life this morning, as we look at this passage, part two in our Standing Firm series, what would he do? What's really involved if you really want to be like Jesus? And we say we do, but do we really want to be like Jesus? I hope you have your outlines. Uh, it's four short verses and two pages. We will try to finish this today, and that is my goal. 
Now, if you are able and in honor of God's Word in both auditoriums, would you stand with me as I read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 in the ESV version. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. You may be seated. Let's see in our notes the exhortation we've ended there last week, have this mind which in yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, most people believe, scholars believe, this is the earliest Christological hymn ever written from these, four, these several verses. We're going to look at two parts of this this week and then the ending next week. And he's referring to the whole church, not just individuals, yourselves, all of us. And so he's going to give this illustration that Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. Now, when you can't do things very well in your life, it's easy to be humble. Yeah, I don't have to worry about being a basketball player anymore. There was no room for a two-inch vertical in the NBA, right? But there are things you think you're pretty good at, and it's hard not to brag about that. Now, I know where I fit on like the food chain of preachers. You know, there are people that are on the radio and whatnot, and then they're so interesting, and they always have this killer conclusion, and you go, oh man, I want to accept Jesus again and again, or I mean, I just learned so much. I'm driving over here today, and I said, Lord, give me some inspiration. I turn on uh, Sirius XM, and Robert Morris is preaching on this passage. I go, oh, I don't want to listen to it. He might have a better conclusion. I turn it off. I go, that's not being very humble. You can still learn. There's still time to change. And he did have a killer conclusion, but it, it is not mine, all right? And so the idea is, think about this. Jesus, the ultimate example, one commentator said this way, in his gentle humility, he poured water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. What a contrast to the wrangling over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. That's the context for all of this as Paul reflects on this passage. So we see this emptying. This is so famous in theological circles. They'll debate this for days and days and days, but it's pretty simple. Let's look at the straightforward text, the emptying. And now we're going to look at the emptying or lowering of Christ, and then next week the exalting or lifting of Christ. So What's that emptying involved? Well, first it involves his substance, who, although he existed in the form, a.k.a. nature, of God. Now, this is uh, an, an interesting word. I don't normally parse a Greek verb for you, but today we will do it. We're going to look at this word, uh, existed in the form. What does that mean? That's that word morphe. Now, that's not really the best translation because you think of form, you think of like outward appearance, you think of, uh, of that, but that's not exactly what we're going to get at. We're actually, when he uses that form, he's talking about the nature of who Christ is. And even though he preexisted in the divine form, aka nature of God, he didn't take equality with him as something that he had to have. And so when we think of it, we think of size and shape, and, and that's not the word used. We'll talk about a different word when we talk about little outward appearance in just a moment. Um, in fact, you think of maybe masquerade, but don't think of that. You think of manifestation. He is God. This is so important. Now, when we want to talk about kind of the outward appearance, that would be the word schema. That's a different Greek word. And that will change from time to time. Let me give you an example. I was born 67 years ago. I weighed at that point the lightest of my entire life. It was awesome. I was an eight pounder. I was a big bowling ball. All right. But through time, uh, from birth, the morphe is who I am. I'm a, I am human. I wasn't a bird. I wasn't an antelope. I wasn't a, 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 a lion. I was a human being. And that morphe is my essence. However, I began as a zygote, and then I became an embryo, 
and then I was, uh, became a fetus, and then I was a small baby who was born. I was an infant, a toddler. I became an adolescent. I'm an adult, and now some would call me a senior adult. I don't like that term. I'm going to just tell you right now, I am a seasoned adult. Yeah? I got a lot of flavor, and I am hot and spicy sometimes. All right? And so the bottom line is that morphe, I'm a human being, doesn't change, but my physical appearance has changed. And we know that, and that's why as we get older and uh, we get larger, we wear baggy clothing when we preach. We hide behind pulpits. We do all kinds of things. Now, what's make clear that this is not saying that because he became man that he lost his deity. Jesus Christ is God, equal with God, the triune portion, second person of the Trinity, God. A couple of verses. Colossians 1, 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. John 1, 1 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not like the Jehovah's Witness translate, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. Uh Uh-uh. He's not one of many. He is God. John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and did what? Dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as only the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then John 17, 24. One more verse for your theological notebook. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, they may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit existed, coexisted, co-equals from eternity past to eternity present. Now, we see his selflessness. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, even though he desired, he didn't have to have. He had all the attributes. Uh, I, I would say it best described as an isosceles triangle, huh? Math majors out there, what's an isosceles, <laughs> easy for me to say, <laughs> triangle? They all have equal sides. How about this, Colossians 1.15, Christ is the exact likeness. He's the isosceles triangle. They are one. He was fully God. He still is fully God. And yet we got to figure out how does this manhood fit in with being God? By the way, this is, this is a problem for some skeptics, isn't it? It's not easy to explain how can he be God? How can he be man? We talked a little bit about that at the incarnation when we did our series of Stable Christmas last month. So here's what I want to summarize happens by, in this phrase. He had all the rights and privileges at his disposal, but he refused to selfishly cling to those. He didn't take his favored position and use it to his advantage. What's a good illustration of that? Some of you, maybe in this room, are trust babies. You're a little old to be called a baby, but you inherited a large sum of money through an inheritance and maybe something happened and you were seven when it happened, so you couldn't get access to your trust until you were 21, right? But then a boatload of blessing came down the pipeline into your bank account. Now you say, who is that person? I would like to meet them, right? I would like to, no, that would be using them for your purposes. But if you were on the receiving that, and I've known some people It's a very difficult position because when you are like that, you don't have to work because it's all been given to you. Jesus, quote, didn't have to work. He gave that up voluntarily. He's the ultimate trust baby. Ultimate trust baby. And he gave it all up to become the suffering servant for us. I saw a cute little movie of that where a guy who makes a lot of money meets the girl, and you know how it goes. He doesn't want her to know he's got a lot of money. He wants to know if she loves him for who he is and not what he has and all this. And it has all kinds of funny complications as he's trying to cover up that he's actually loaded. And I think that's so interesting. So many times in our life, we don't realize that we are children of the king. We are loaded, literally. And yet sometimes we act like, we are a pauper. 
and Jesus gave it all up. And so, literally, it says in uh, Romans 4, 14, it was nullified or it was made void, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. And so, he emptied himself of that privilege, even though he created and owned everything. And so, this emptying of, was not of his divine nature. He didn't give up being God. He gave up his divine prerogative to use it to his advantage. Now, this uh, being God and then humanity added to the mix is called the anthrop anthropic nature of Christ. That's the one and only time I'll say that because I don't want to have to repeat it again. But it's that union of deity and humanity. Now, you say, because of that, what did he lay aside? It says in Scripture he lay aside two things. In your notes, his glory, John 17, 5, and now, Father, I glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so he didn't surrender his deity, but he veiled his glory. But this is the big one, his independent use of some of his relative attributes. He restricted himself from the benefits of the attributes that he could have claimed and used as God, so he didn't benefit himself. In fact, most people believe that he never used his deity outside, and I believe this is true according to Scripture, outside of the Father's will. If the Father said it was okay, it was okay. So, he's being tempted in the wilderness. Forty days, he doesn't eat. The tempter, Satan, says, turn these what? Stones into bread. Did he do it? No. He laid aside that attribute. He could have, but he didn't. Now, flip it though. There's 5,000 pe people listening to a sermon that goes longer than mine. They're on a hillside. They've passed lunch. They're well into the dinner hour. They are hungry and hangry. And the disciples say, hey, we got to feed these folks. He does take five loaves and two fishes and feeds 5,000 people for their benefit and for God's glory. And so uh, they, we see that in the incarnation there were four areas of change. And I think you need to know this as committed Christ followers because we get kind of confused about being God, being man. Here's what happened. When he came from heaven to earth, which we celebrated at Christmas, he changed his place of dwelling. First place, change of dwelling. I put all four of the points in there if you want to fill in those blanks. From heaven to earth, and I won't read the scriptures. Possessions from riches to poverty. All right? From power and glory to relative obscurity until he starts healing people and then the word's out. And then the big one, his position from equality with God to a servant, suffering servant man. Now, the first three of those are, were all temporary. All of those have been restored now in present day. The one thing that hasn't been restored is that he is only God. And this is sometimes something we don't realize. He remains today both God and man for all perpetuity into the future. He is both. He has assumed that human nature and form. He takes that back to heaven as man, and therefore he sits at the right hand of God as our mediator, knowing that he understands what we are going through as a human being. Now, that may be news to you. Maybe you've never quite thought about it that way, but he is both God and man now and forevermore. Fourthly, his servanthood. He took the form of a bondservant or a slave, all right? And that uh, doesn't mean that he exchanged it. He added to it, so to speak. And we won't get into that too much, but we know bondservants and slaves. They have no rights. They have no land. They have no house. They have no gold, no jewels, no business, no boats. In fact, think about Jesus, born in a feeding trough. He had to borrow a, a donkey at the... Um, that uh, triumphal entry, uh, he's buried in a borrowed tomb. He, they had to rent a room for the Last Supper, on and on and on. He was a bondservant. And typically, bondservants carried things for people that they served, their stuff, literally. And so the supreme bondservant carried for us 
the ultimate burden, which was what? Our sin. Yeah, the ultimate thing he would have to carry. And so our scripture that refers to us, he says to us in 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Think about how many characters in the Bible were promoted and then had to wait. This is not exciting if those of you who are waiting to become president of your company and uh, you're the favorite son and you're going to get it someday, but dad still got control, so to speak, or any other place where you've had to wait. Um, Joseph, right? He, he waits 13 years. You know, he's thrown in a pit, thrown into prison, on and on and on, and he waits 13 years. David, 14 years. He's anointed king by Samuel, and then he waits 14 years before he actually takes on the throne of Judah. And so I think about how easy it is for us to strive, and, and we want stuff now. Um, okay. I, this is one of those moments of truth, and I'm like, look, and yeah, you're smiling still, so I'll tell the truth. All right. <laughs> it is so hard sometimes for me over my lifetime to wait and not strive and, and position to be in the place to be noticed or do this, that, or the other thing. For most of my ministry career, 44 years, I have served as associate pastor, the number two guy. Not the number one guy, the number two guy. And what that means is you get to do, in some cases, in smaller churches, that means you get to do everything that the big guy doesn't want to do, right? That's no fun. Like, hey, make sure those chairs mop up, do this, do that. Okay, I can do that. And then you get a, to a little larger church and then maybe you get promoted and now you're managing stuff and then God invented a thing called interns. And you go, oh, now I can delegate that to someone else. But then you feel guilty because that seems kind of lame. I hated doing some of that. And everybody else left. And I was left literally holding the mop. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to my people. And I got to tell you, I wasn't always perfect at it. But it, it was a lot better being in the trenches together. And I got to tell you, when you get a new pastor, I'm praying to God that he has a humble servant spirit because he is inheriting a team I would die for. I would love to be a part of this team. And you say, you're just saying that because you're kissing up to the staff and you know they paid you, they paid you to say that. No, no, no. I've worked for some really seriously dysfunctional people. I also would pray, Lord, deliver me from evil. <laughs> Is it my time, Lord? I'm ready to be with Jesus. It was painful. But that's not what you got here, friends. And I hope every day you are thankful for that staff that you, God's given you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Enough of a, you know, I was at a basketball game cheering. Now we're cheering this morning. It's, it's a good day. Now, According to the Talmud then, and you can see what kind of person you are. There were four kinds of people. Look at it on your screen. What is yours is yours. What's yours is mine. What's mine is mine. And what's mine is yours. You see, if you were a two-year-old, everything is yours. That toy you're playing with, it's mine. Toy that I want to play with, it's mine. The toy that you bought for your, your brother, that's now mine. You know, on and on and on. And so sometimes we want to just exert our rights to be right. I am sorry to, to disappoint you, but sometimes I just don't get it right. I know I should behave better. I know I should be kind to the guy who cut me off on the freeway. And I smile and... and I mumble under my breath things I should have never mumbled, and I'm so glad it's in the car and they didn't hear it. And you've been there. Get angry like that. And I love to say I had a chance to just show Jesus. I was getting gas on my way here yesterday. And the problem at this gas station, the bathroom is perennially closed. It's open to those who work there and their favorite people, but apparently if you're me, it's never open for business. 
And I've noticed that. And of course, why do I wait to go to get gas like this, right? <laughs> go home, get the gas later. And so it was one of those moments. I'll just be a little frank with you. And I notice that there actually is a key to the bathroom and it's tied to like, like a shovel handle. <laughs> and she gives the, guy, the key to the guy in front of me. And I look at her incredibly because I've asked before and been denied. And I said, oh, the bathroom's open. She just looks at me. And what she said was, yeah, the bathroom's open, but it's never going to be open for you. And I'm going, what did I do? She didn't say it. She just thought it. Now, know how I've just invented this story about what she's thinking? Do you ever do that? You judge people on what they're thinking. And they've never even said it. And I said, so, hey, the bathroom's open. She goes, it's working. And I said, oh, that's great. It, it's always closed when I come. The bathroom's working. Have a nice day, sir. And I didn't get a chance to ask to use the bathroom. Yea, thus verily, I am ticked. You're saying you are so immature. I am immature. I'm admitting it. I'm, in, I'm acting like a two-year-old. That bathroom is mine. I should own that, right? Well, let's just say it went from bad to worse, and I kind of, and she kind of, and then she said, have a nice day, and I should have said, you know what, God bless you. You have a nice day too, even though you keep me from using your bathroom every time I'm here, but I didn't. She said, had a nice day, and I kind of just ignored her, and I walked away. And then I go, and as soon as I walk away, I feel horrible because I know that I'm going to confess this to you, and then I'm going to go to that gas station on Monday on my way home, and I'm going to have to apologize because I have now admitted to you that I was a total idiot because I wasn't acting like Jesus would. I was selfish. I was entitled. I was wanting something that was just not worth having that conversation over. And so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go, and I'm hoping she's working there on Monday, sometime after 3 o'clock, after I've sat in two hours of traffic, getting home. I'll have a smile on my face, and I say, I want to apologize, because I didn't act like I want to act, because Jesus would have never treated you like that. You see, I could have given you a great story of how I've lived this out, but the reality is we face these kinds of what would Jesus do situations in our lives all the time. And sometimes we do great. And, we, and, we're, and Jesus is like, way to go, kid. You're getting it. But so many times he's going, holy vey. He, he, was, he was Jewish, right? Holy vey, you know. And um, we got to do over. Amen? So pray for me that I do the right thing on Monday. All right. Now, Here's the example. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the simplicity of this and the sacrifice of this. Jesus lowered himself so that he could be a sacrifice. So why did he allow himself to go to the cross? He could have had 10,000 angels and boom, he's out of that thing. Two reasons. Romans 5, 8 says to demonstrate his love to us. He demonstrated God's love to us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And secondly, because of the thing called sin that's in our lives. He paid for our sin. Not a popular term, but we know, that according to Romans 3.20, that all have sinned, and there's a consequence for that sin in Romans 6.23. Now, I am so grateful that he did that, that he humbled himself and did the right thing and followed the, uh, followed the will of the Father. Now the sacrifice. So becoming obedient to the point of death. Uh, if I'm still preaching here by Easter, we will talk more about uh, the crucifixion. But suffice it to say, he's mocked, he's falsely accused, he's spat upon, his beard is pulled out, he's got the crown of thorns, uh, he's beaten nearly to death, but he's never defensive never complaining, didn't lash out, didn't assert his rights, didn't strike them dead, and he took it. 
And he took it for you. And he took it for me. And he took it for all of eternity. And for all humanity. For all of us. And so we know that execution was a a special form of death that was concocted by the Romans. Um, It was only reserved for the worst criminals. And in fact, Roman citizens couldn't be executed this way. It was for foreigners and slaves and others. And he was so disgraced, there's a sign on that cross that he was cursed. So ultimately, friends, today, we need Jesus. We can't simply answer the question, what would Jesus do? Because we need Jesus to do that thing. Whatever that hard thing in your life is, you need Jesus. You need the Son. I want to close with a story that you probably haven't heard, but it represents such a beautiful illustration of how we need the Son. A wealthy man and his son loved to co- collect rare works of art, and they had everything in their collection from Picasso to Raphael, and they would often sit together and admire the great works of art. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, his son went to war, and he was a very courageous kid, and he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified he grieved deeply for his only son, And about a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock on the door, and a young man stood at the door with a large package in his hands. He said, Sir, you don't know me, but I'm the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you, about your love for art, and how you would look at it together. And so the young man held out this package. He said, I I know this isn't much. I'm not a really great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. So the father opened the package. It's a portrait of his son painted by the young man, and he stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son, the painting, and, and his eyes welled up with tears, and he thanked the young man. He offered to pay him for the picture. He said, oh, oh, no, sir, I could never repay what your son did for me. It's a gift. The father hung the portrait over his mantle, and every time visitors came to his home, he took them first to see that portrait of his son by this unknown army friend. And he showed them that first before anything else that he had collected. Well, unfortunately, the father died a few months later. And there was a big auction that there was going to be had of all of his paintings. And so many, many art folks came up, people, wealthy people who wanted to buy some of what he had in his portfolio. And the auctioneer pounded the gavel and he started very curiously because the only, there was all this artwork around him, but there was one center stage and it's the picture of his son. He said, we'll start the bidding with the picture of the son. Who will bid for the picture of the son? There's deafening silence. Then a voice in the back of the room said, Hey, 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 we want to see the famous paintings. Why don't we skip this one? But the auctioneer persisted. Who will bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? A hundred? Two hundred? Silence. Another voice a little angrily says, Hey, we didn't come for this. Where's the Rembrandts? Where's the Van Goghs? Get on with the real bids. But the auctioneer continues. The sun, the sun. Who will take the sun? Finally, a voice came from the very back of the room. It was the longtime gardener of the man. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll give $10 for the painting. He was a poor man. It was all he could afford. Auctioneer says, we have 10. Do I have 20? I have 10. Do I have 20? Do I have 50? Do I have 100? Do I have 10? The crowd begins to seethe in anger. They didn't want the picture of the sun. They wanted more worthy investments. And so the auctioneer pounded the gavel, going once, going twice, sold for $10. The man in the second row said, finally, let's get on with this. And then the auctioneer laid down his gavel and said, I'm sorry. 
the auction is over. What about the paintings? He said, I'm sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal the stipulation until this time. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. And whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including all of these paintings. The man who took the sun gets everything. Friends, God gave us his son 2,000 years ago. And when you get the son, you get everything. Amen? Amen. Next week, we are going to flip the script. And we go from his emptying to his exaltation. And I'm giving you fair warning. Many of you have made Jesus your Savior, but you've never made him your Lord. That's where we're headed next week. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.